Well, thank you, Matthew. And uh, I'm just full of gratitude, really just joy and gratitude to be here this morning. Um, let me just do a mic check real quick and see if uh, sound's coming through. How's the sound check out there this morning? Good. All right, excellent. We like to begin our classes that way, so it's nice to uh, start out this way. Well, um, again, I just have uh, kind of a heart full this morning. Um, and actually, uh, let me go ahead and put the camera on here. I kind of apologize for this. I had my nice webcam all set up and for some reason it's not connected. So we're going to have to make do with my little computer webcam this morning. But anyway, have somewhat of a visual. Um, Okay, um, so I have I have a, just a lot of thanks this morning. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, TPS admin and Mr. Gilbert for uh, really partnering with CLM. It's really um, great to see that kind of partnership, and uh, because we so believe in CLM and uh, you students and uh, all that you're doing, and so we're just grateful. And then, um, not least, I, I am so grateful for you students who are a part of this ministry. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm so grateful for you students that are a part of this ministry, and uh, you all uh, you all have a dear place in our hearts um, through the classes uh, that we get to be a part of together, many of you. And then also, um, I just have such a deep uh, appreciation for and love for students who love Jesus and are into his word. And so I just want to thank you all for doing that. I want to thank you all for um, being so engaged in this kind of ministry. And for those of you who are in the classes, uh, for being so engaged in the classes, thank you for being uh, teenagers who are willing to seek after Jesus and to respond to him for such a time as this. Um, I, I just am so grateful. And you all mean so much to us. We have such really uh, a deep love and appreciation for each of you. And uh, Matthew and and some of you, we've grown so close over these uh, over these last three years and over these last few months for some of you. So again, thank you so much all for being here. Um, I know this is kind of an unusual choice for an Advent message today, but we are going to look at uh, Jude verses one through three. And so, if you have your Bible this morning, I'd invite you to just kind of get it open to Jude verses one through three. Let me know when you got that. I want to give you a minute to make sure that you have your Bible this morning and that you're able to be engaged. Thank you again for being so engaged in the word. Um, as you're finding in your own personal life, that is exactly um, what we need. We need the word and it's the word that Jesus is able to speak to us through and really uh, bring growth to our lives and change to our lives. It is actually just through the word. Okay, outstanding. Getting that Bible open. So again, this is maybe the most unusual Advent message that you will have ever heard. <laughs> so in any case, but it's just another testimony to one of the things that we talk about in our classes, and that is that um, the word, the written word, is the expression of the living word, Jesus. And so what's really encouraging about that is that no matter where I turn in the book, the written word, uh, Jesus is going to be revealed. He's going to reveal himself. And so we come to the scripture always seeking him and the revelation of who he is. And uh, that's what we do this morning. We want to just really seek him and know him this morning through the word. So let me just read uh, Jude verses one through three. I might even uh, slip down into verse four a little bit, probably later on. Um, but let me read verse one through three, if I would. I should actually have probably Mattias read this this morning. I don't know if Mattias is here still, uh, but I know Mattias is uh, is studying Jude kind of uh, kind of alongside of me uh, this semester. So is he here still? Mattias, do you want to get on microphone and actually read that? Verses one through three. All right. The servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you the contentment for the faith that was once 
pull a little bit to the same. All right, thanks, Mattis. So this is obviously the beginning of the letter, everybody, and it really um, introduces what kind of who Jude is and what he's all about and what is the whole emphasis of this letter um, that he's writing. Okay, and so um, I want to just give you a little bit of background on the book of Jude because it's uh, it wasn't very familiar to me. Of course, I've, I've seen it and uh, heard it and just... Um, you know, kind of a, a cursory kind of things about it. But this is my first time to really delve deep in. And as many of you know, it is um, what we learn in our Lagos classes is that getting deep, 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 and even in Bible survey, getting deep into the word is what allows us to kind of see the whole big picture, the context, the background, um, and what's going on, the original audience and so forth. And so um, in Jude, um, one thing we realize, a few things, is that Jude is one of the later um, books written in the New Testament. Uh, it's it's among what we call the general epistles in the New Testament. Um, it's written much later than many of the other uh, New Testament books. It's probably, um, I'm, I might venture to say, it might even be the second to the uh, well, not second to the last, probably some of the writings of John are going to be the later latest writings of the New Testament because he was the last living of the apostles. But Jude is kind of one of he's kind of the he's kind of one of the later writings. Um, Jude has kind of outlived um, most of the other apostles. And one good reason for that is that he was it says even in verse one, you see that he's kind of the little brother of Jesus and James. So obviously Jude being the little brother, obviously, you know, in most cases, uh, uh, you know, barring catastrophe or barring uh, something unexpected, the little brother is the one that's going to live the longest. And so Jude has kind of outlived everybody. He was the little brother. Some estimates are that he was maybe 10 years younger than Jesus. And so he was the youngest of those, you know, those half brothers of Jesus. And so now, um, after many of the church leaders have already um, been martyred, or are dead, um, Jude is still around and he's kind of taken the baton and he is carrying the message for as um, the early church is kind of moving into kind of a different phase um, of its existence. Okay. And so it's probably written, some estimates are in the 60s, the 70s, or some even would say in the 80s. And the thing that I like to kind of think about with Jude and uh, the way he characterize it would be that. Um, I characterize the culture like the wild, wild west. Now, when you all think about the wild, wild west, you know, you read old westerns or see um, western movies here um, of America's, you know, western, early west. What do you think about? What comes to your mind when you think about the wild, wild west? Anybody have an answer in the chat box today? What does the wild, wild west kind of uh, bring to your mind? Rowdy people, sure, you know, Cowboys, <laughs> all right. Lawlessness, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, the lack of infrastructure, the gambling. Yeah, so you guys get the idea of just kind of this lawless culture. So there's just this wild um, kind of anything goes, um, save yourself, right? Kind of the anything goes, do what you want. There's no law. And really what happened, everybody, is this is kind of the climate a little bit as the early church experienced several decades and it's now you know a few decades after jesus and the early church there had been false teachings that started to float around a lot of heresy um things like gnosticism and so forth and so there is this kind of a, a lawless culture there is almost an anything goes mentality in their culture there is kind of this this wild wild west false teaching everybody doing their own thing um church people christians living the way they want to live doing their own thing etc etc right by the way does that sound familiar to anybody does that sound like a familiar dynamic possibly to anybody <laughs> does that sound a little bit like maybe what we're experiencing today in the world we have a lawless culture. We have anything goes. We have even Christians and church people that are doing their own thing and false teaching and living the way you want to live and do what you want to, you know, do what you want to do and so forth and so on, right? And so it's into the middle of this chaos 
chaos and there was a lot of um, what I would call anti movements. There were, you know, people were always against something. There was, um, uh, you know, people carrying picket signs and people being against things and lots of uh, lots of demonstrations and and lots of just just chaos and against. And it is into the middle of this culture, into the middle of, in the middle of this culture, uh, and in the church that Jude later on writes this letter to the people, to the Christians. And so it is, um, as we said, it is what we call a, a general, it's one of what we call the general epistles, like along with Peter and Hebrews, written towards the end of the New Testament era, the apost apostolic era. Um, it is written not to a particular church, but it is written to kind of the Christians everywhere. Um, he, you know, all of you out there who are believers, Here's the message that I have for you. And so it's a really comforting letter because in the middle of this chaos and confusion, Jude writes this letter. And, and it's a very hard-hitting letter, no doubt about it. It's, it's a kind of a one commentator calls it a hammer blow. Um, William Barclay says that it is like a hammer blow to um, when it comes down. Um, but it is a it is a basically a a message that calls for revival. It says Jude is writing to the church and saying, church, um, we need revival. We need revival. We need to come back to the truth of Jesus. We need to come back to his word. We need to come back to who he is. And we need to bring our lives back under the authority and respond to him with our entire lives in contrast to this culture of chaos. Amen. And that is what we need also today. I kind of missed my highlighter pen today like I have in TPS on the whiteboard. I would highlight that word revival right now. We need revival. And, and we, especially in an election year like this, everybody coming up, you know, we have all different opinions of we need this or we need that or we need, you know, Trump or not Trump or whoever is our candidate. You know, that's what we need. And the truth of the matter is here in America, and I'm sure in places like England or um, wherever you might be overseas, um, we need revival. And that is the answer for our world today. We need a revival of coming back to Jesus. And that's why I so appreciate this ministry. I appreciate CLM ministry and your focus on Jesus and getting back to the word. Okay, so let's, let's dive in. And one thing that's evident about Jude is that Jude was experiencing revival in his own life. And that's what I really like about the verses that Mattias read this morning. As you read those first three verses, um, this is not Jude just pointing a finger at the um, people saying, you guys need revival. What he's doing is he's expressing, and what we see today is that he's experiencing revival in his own life. And then that is spilling over into what he writes in the letter. So, and by the way, isn't that true, everybody, that revival begins with us, doesn't it, right? Revival begins with us, and I want revival to begin with me today, not a pointing of a finger to say, you know, you need it. I, I know that I need it today. Um, and so this, um, I, I see in these, just in the first three verses, some principles of revival or of spiritual growth and renewal that I'd like to share with you today on this on this Christmas message, and, and we'll tie all that together. First of all, it's obvious in verse 3. If you look at verse 3 in your Bible, it's obvious that Jude had a shift from what he was planning on doing to what God moved him to do. Does everybody see that? Everybody see that he, it says, I was diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. In other words, this is what I was going to do. And then it says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. So do you all see that there was a change in direction for Jude? It was like an interruption, a change in stream. OK, and so God moved him from what he was doing, from what he was intending, from what he was in the process of doing to something new. And that that's kind of a heart of revival, isn't it? Uh, what revival is about. Revival is about God. What do you want to do new 
in my life. And so um, I'm going to invite you to kind of dig down with me a little bit into the grammar today. So, you know, if I was in a Lagos class right now with um, some of our students here, like uh, who do I got Matthew and uh, um, Simi and Mattias Levi, um, some of you who've been in those classes, um, we, we would probably dig down into this. We would we would start to tear this apart. So look at the first phrase with me. And I'd probably show you on the screen some um, uh, e sword or blue letter Bible or something like that. But let's let's kind of talk through it today. Look at look at verse three, the first phrase. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. Now, a few observations we talk in Bible study about observing, and then we make our interpretation based on the observations. So one observation is that in this in this phrase, those are present tense verbs. And those of you from our Lagos classes know that the present tense verbs often indicate something that is in process or ongoing. Okay, so um, already we get the idea that Jude was kind of in the middle of something. This was an ongoing thing for him. Now, secondly, when he says, um, I was very, very diligent to write to you, it doesn't show up well in the English, but in the Greek, the, the whole idea of him writing this um, comes from the Greek word poieo, poieo. Um, and the word poieo in the original Greek communicates the idea of a creative process like an artist. Now, real quick, can anybody tell an English word that we derive from the Greek word poieo just by looking at it kind of an artistic kind of a a thing an artistic kind of a word yeah exactly right justin poetry yes i mean that's right poetry so from poieo we get poetry and it's that idea of the creativity the creativity now furthermore this this verb poieo in there is a participle now you i know you guys are big grammar fans out there all you tps students and um, I know you love participles, right? And a participle is a dependent verb. Um, in other words, it's not a main verb. It's, it's going to anticipate that there's another main thing happening in just a moment. So all that communicates this. When you put those pieces together, here's what that communicates. You get this picture. And this, that's what I like about the scripture paints a picture. Jude was in a process of writing everybody he was in this you ever been in in the flow of creative process you know you ever been sitting down and you're just kind of like carried away with your writing um you know you just really are i think i see allison um is that allison nagel i think i say allison here i know she would be a writer that is into that creative flow right into that um into that you know what i mean you just like you, you're in the flow you're in the groove right you're just in the middle of that and that's where jude was he was in the middle of writing, but something happened. Look at the second part of the verse. In the next part of the verse, it says, but I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend for the faith. So what it shows now is that in the middle of, in the midst of, I had this plan and I was in the flow, all of a sudden I had. Now, I found it necessary. And in the Greek, the, the I found is the Greek word echo or I had. And that is the main, it's the only independent verb in the whole verse. In other words, this is the big idea. This is the big idea. And um, it's it's um, the verbs um, I found it or I had and write to you are in the aorist tense, which are now more kind of like exact, like punctiliar in action, like they're the facts. So so here's what it seems to communicate. Jude was in this flow, okay? This is what he was planning. This is what he was doing. And then all of a sudden, what happened is that God interrupted him. You got that? God brought an interruption to Jude's life. And God said, I'm calling you to do something new. I'm escalating you. There's a new level. I'm bringing an escalation about. It's not that that was bad and this is good. That was good. But I'm calling you to a new level. I want to interrupt what was good. And that's a key idea, everybody. 
the key idea in this, a key idea, is that it doesn't mean what Jude was doing was bad or wrong. See, we, we fall into that trap. If God speaks to me about something, that must mean that what I was doing was bad. And then Satan uses that to produce guilt and he gets me in bondage and he gets me distracted from what God's trying to do in my life. See, here's the thing. What Jude was doing or what any of us are doing might be something good at the right time. Maybe it's something that's good and it's God's will and it's right and it's good in the time that God has for it, and there's nothing wrong with it. However, sometimes in the middle of the good and the right, God wants to interrupt me, and he wants to call me to a new level. You understand? He wants to call me to a new level. And the thing about the new level, then, is everybody, is that when God, when God calls me to something new, I can't stay where I am or go back to what I was doing. And here's the deal. That thing that I was doing may not have been bad or wrong, or what I'm into is not bad or wrong. Like Jude writing a letter, right? He said in verse 3, I, I wanted to write to you about our common salvation. Is that a bad thing? Not at all. But God's calling him to something more urgent, to something higher, to something more um extreme to something more um, just important at this moment. And so do you understand that maybe something's not bad in and of itself, right? As we just said, it's not bad. It's not wrong. But if I tried to stay there and if I tried to go back to it, maybe it becomes wrong if God is calling me to something new. Does that make sense? Now, that's kind of, that's a new thought for us because we might look at certain things in our lives and say this question, what could be wrong with that, right? What could be bad about that? Just, just like Jude. You know, Jude says, that's exactly right, Justin. You know, for instance, Jude's, Jude's going to write a letter about, it says, about our common salvation. And we look at that and say, what could be wrong with that? Isn't that a good thing? Right? What could be wrong with that? What could be bad about that? Sorry, and all my students see my famous blue cup that I'm drinking from in class. What could be wrong with that? Okay, but we can't, we can't go back when he calls us to something new. Does that make sense, everybody? It's a new level. So, question for me today, and I, I need to get through this pretty quick. Am I open to his interruption in my life? Am I open to even what seems good now? And am I, there might be something in my life where I say, well, what could be wrong with that? Or what could be so bad about that? And yet, am I open to Jesus taking me and moving me to a new level, to something new? Just in his plan, it's more important. In his plan, it's more urgent. And that's what revival is, everybody. It is God moving me from what might be good to what might be more urgent in God's plan. Are you open to his interruption in your life? God, just interrupt me. <laughs> Inter break in on me and interrupt anything in my life. Amen? Okay, so a second principle is this. A second principle is this. Look again at verse 3. And I should probably have that verse up here, but you got it in your Bible. He says, you know, I found it necessary or I had necessity. Now, that word, if we would look this up for sure in Logos class, the word necessary is the Greek verb, is a Greek uh, noun, um, anagkain, anagkain. Now, that word is very, very strong. And you can see some of the definitions here on the screen. That word can literally mean necessity force, constraint, natural want or desire, actual force later down in the definition, it can actually talk about um, actual force, violence, bodily pain, suffering, anguish, or distress. How many of you think that's a pretty strong word? That's the word that he's using here. That's the word. And that it's so strong. It's the same word that the Apostle Paul 
uses in 1 Corinthians 9.16 when he's talking about his call to preach back there in 1 Corinthians 9.16. And he says, necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I preach not the gospel. In other words, I've got to. It's 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 I'm I'm gripped by it. I I am actually just um in in anguish over it. I'll I'll be miserable if I don't. It's just a force. It's it's necessity like I can't describe. It is it is I have to. I've got to. It's uh it's uh I know this is going extreme today and don't take it too far, but it's almost like the compulsion that an addict would feel about something. It's like I got to, I can't live without it. This has just got a hold of me in every single way. And so do you see everybody that that's what Jude is expressing? Jude is saying that, hey, I was along writing this and but all of a sudden God hit me. And I had to do this. I couldn't help it. I just was gripped by this necessity, this urgency, this compulsion to write to you to contend earnestly for the faith. And that that whole contending will be another message another time. But what we're getting out of that, everybody, again, um, and, and maybe it communicates it further that in the Greek, when it says um, that, I found it necessary. It's actually the Greek. The Greek word is I had necessity. It's the Greek word echo. I had necessity. Now, it's a little hard to understand, but it's similar to the Spanish verb tener. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Spanish out there. And uh, you guys know what the Spanish word tener um, literally means. To, remember this in Spanish class? The word tener means to have something, right? And so one example of tener would be um, saying like, yo tengo hambre. Okay, anybody know their Spanish out there? Yo tengo hambre means what? I'm hungry. Okay, but literally what you're saying when you say yo tengo or tener hambre is that I have hunger. In other words, it's something inside of me. It's something that is from inside, right? And so here's what um, Jude is saying. This gripped me from inside. I just couldn't help it. I, I was, I, you know, I was going along. I was going to write this, you know, about our common salvation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But all of a sudden, God hit me with this, I must. I was driven. I was compelled from inside. Because you guys are all teenagers out there besides, um, I think I saw Mrs. Wydick out there. But um, you guys are teenagers, and you guys know when teenagers are hungry, what do you do generally? When teenagers are hungry, what do they do? Especially I'm thinking about these teenage boys out there. Do you guys notice that when teenagers are hungry, they usually get up. Now, there's two options. Now, I hope this isn't some of you. Some of you are, hey, mom, bring me something to eat. And some of you, I hopefully, are not pampered by your mother to, you know. Most of you, when you eat, you, do you notice that eating is you're compelled, you're driven. It actually gets you up off the couch. Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night, you know, or maybe in the middle of the day, there are a few things that are going to get you up. But being hungry is one of them. It literally gets you up off the couch. It gets you up from your desk. It makes you walk across the room. Sometimes, uh, you know, depending on how hungry you are, maybe you have to walk a few miles. I don't know wherever you live, or um, you, you, you know, it drives you. You say, and and you say, well, who told you to do that? Who told you to go get something to eat? No one had to tell you. You were driven. Anybody ever felt that? Maybe some of you haven't had breakfast yet or dinner, and you feel driven, right? All right, I got to. I'm driven. I'm compelled. Well, do you all know that's a healthy thing, isn't it? Isn't it a good thing and a healthy thing when you have an appetite and it makes you want to get up and get something? That that means you're a healthy human being, right? And and to not feel that way is is to not is you know is not natural. And that's what Jude's experiencing. Jude, I would propose to you that Jude is driven. He can't help himself. Jude, why are you writing this letter? I, I can't help it. I had to. I had another plan for what I was going to write. But Jesus so got a hold of me with this. He interrupted me, and I feel this compulsion that I have to. I, I believe, students, isn't that what revival is too? 
don't you believe that revival means that in Christian life, nobody has to tell us, okay, go to church, read your Bible, give in the offering, help little old ladies across the street, do good deeds. Don't you believe that the Christian life, that when you're healthy, it becomes all about, I can't help it. I, I go to my church because I can't help it. I want to. I get into my Bible because I'm, I'm being driven to. I want to. I have a hunger. I have a natural, healthy hunger. And, 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 and students, isn't it great that God will give us that? That's right, Allison. Isn't that great that he will give us that if, if we ask? And if we're open, that that's the healthy thing that he wants to do in our lives. All right. So as, as we I'm going to start kind of heading towards wrapping up today. But first of all, I would ask this. Are you know, how am I compelled today in my spiritual life? Is Jesus escalating me to a new level? And how is he moving me in my life to get up? <laughs> how is he moving me in my life to do something different to drive me to himself? Okay, so finally, one last principle kind of a revival is this. Oh, and by the way, don't we need a body of Christ that is moved in our day? Wouldn't you say, everybody, in our day, we need the body of Christ to be compelled and moved from inside in our day, right? Just driven and compelled, and we can't help ourselves. We've got to reach our world. We've got to seek Jesus together. We've got to be into the Word. So where does all this come from, everybody? And this is what Allison was getting at. She's always, she's always been, and when she was in class with me right here, she's, last year, she's always my right hand on this. What compels us? Where does the hunger come from? And how? And how do we get called to this new level? I want that in my life. How? When? Where? Why? How can this happen in my life? And I'll propose to you this last thing. Pretty obvious, everybody, if you look at verses 1 through 4. That Jude has one focus in his life, right? Do you see it? Look at the one focus in his life. Look at verse 4. He talks about, um, he's talking about that the upset is that people, look at the end of verse 4, they are denying our only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And look at back up to verse 1. He says, I am Jude. I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And look at verse two, um, the end of verse one. Um, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. But Jude's bottom line of his life, everybody, is that he is a bond servant of Jesus Christ. What's the one single compulsion and focus of Jude's life? It's Jesus, and that's why I'm so pleased for a group of teenagers like you that even stated from the top of this um, this program today that we want to be about Jesus and we want to be Christ focused. Let us not be afraid students to be, uh, to be focused on Jesus and Jesus alone. You know, some people in the old days talk about Jesus freaks or whatever, whatever you want to call it. I like, um, I, I need to read the book by Francis Chan called crazy love, which is all about a crazy love, passionate love with Jesus, right? Jesus love in our lives. And so everybody, the reason it's so great to be focused on Jesus is because he is the one who does all of this in us. Amen? I don't have to have my own hunger. I don't have to compel myself. I don't have to call myself to a new level. If I did, everybody, I would be, I would be utterly dismayed and depressed because I'm not able. But I love the prayer of um, Ian Thomas in his book um, called The Indwelling Life of Christ, where he says, Jesus, I can't, but you can, and that's all I need to know. Yeah, that's right, Allison. I, it is he that does the work. And so the fundamental of the Christian life is this, everybody. Jesus moves, I respond. Jesus moves, I respond. So I love this simple focus that Jude has, and it really raises for me this issue this Christmas, that the new level that he wants to call me to is himself. He's the new level, a new level in him. See, would I allow him to give me a compelling hunger 
for him. That he's the new level. He's my desire. He's my urgency. He is the escalation. So isn't, isn't this Christmas, isn't Jesus calling me to a new level of knowing him? Where the cry of my heart becomes, I want to know you more. Like the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, I want to know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your sufferings. I want to know you, Jesus. Jesus, I cry to you this Christmas. I really want to know you more. I just want to be closer to you. I want to know you with greater urgency. I want to know you with greater passion. I want to know you with a crazy love in my life. I want a new level with you, a new level of intimacy. It's not that where I've been is bad. It's probably been good, but Lord, there's more, and I want to be driven to you, and I want to know you more. And so I recognize that this is an Advent message today, and so somebody might be asking, um, and by the way, the bottom line is this, everybody. Jude responded. Do you see that Jude responded to Jesus? He, he allowed Jesus to interrupt his life, you know, even something that could be good. And he allowed himself to be moved from inside to even get up and do something different, Jude. And he went to a new level with Jesus. And the question is this today. Will I respond? Will I respond in my life? And so, again, somebody might be saying, hey, Dr. Juman, that's pretty cool. Um, but why would you choose that for an Advent message? Well, um, a couple things. A couple things. Um, Number one is, as my class knows, this is where I've been studying in my personal life. So this is this is fresh truth for me, and I, I love having fresh new truth in my life. But secondly, everybody, you know, what does this have to do with Christmas? Well, I can easily see how this applies to Christmas. Because first of all, do you all realize that Advent is all about interruption? If, if you've read the Christmas narrative, if you've even watched the movie, the, the nativity story that my family and I will watch on Christmas Eve together, you all realize that Jesus coming was an interruption to everybody in the world. And think of Joseph and Mary. Think about the interruption of what God, think of the painful interruption in their lives. Think of the pain, the suffering, think of the um, the shunning, Think of the scandal. Think of the um, just the, the upheaval, the chaos that it brought to their lives. And next time you watch that, Rachel, or anybody else, think about the chaos and the interruption that it was to their lives. And so, everybody, I think Advent is all about interruption. Yes, it is peace on earth. Yes, it is joy to the world. But never forget this, that Jesus coming into our world is an interruption of everything we have ever known. And so it's very easy for me to get into the tradition and into the normal thing of Christmas. You all know the normal Christmas thing. It's all good. The decorations, the songs, the schedule, the programs, the celebrations. It's all good, isn't it? It's all good. And, and everybody could say, what could be wrong with that? But I wonder if this Christmas, does Jesus want to break in? on our lives and do something to interrupt what we've been doing and interrupt our normal and usual at Christmas this year. Just like his first coming, would he like to come in a special way and interrupt us this Advent season? And secondly, remember that Jude was moved from inside by his hunger, kind of like the yo tango hambre, I wonder if Jesus would want to give me a new hunger and move me inside in a new and a different and an even radical way in the midst of this Christmas season. And, you know, I'm not proposing to you. This is actually a, uh, I think this is a little sign for a Santa Claus run, uh, you know, a Santa Claus 5K on Christmas. And uh, I don't propose that you necessarily have to go do a Santa Claus 5K out there this Christmas. But but is there something that Jesus would want to just move you from inside this Christmas? Like, God, give me a hunger. If you want to do something different in my life, if you want to compel me, 
What is it you want to do in this Christmas season, Jesus, that, man, I just can't help myself and I'm driven? It's not because somebody told me. It's not because I had to, because I can't help it. And then finally, everybody, this. How about going to a new level with Jesus personally this Christmas? How about just really, really, really seeking to know him, not just the baby in the manger, but the man who died on the cross, who rose again, and who sent his spirit to live within us? Would I seek him? Would I seek a deeper intimacy with him, a crazy love? Would I be abandoned to him in a new way this Christmas? Would I respond to him with my whole heart? And would I just run to him, run to him? And would I be open to a new level with Jesus personally this Christmas? So how about it, everybody? You know, he came to seek after us. The baby in the manger came to die so he could be raised again, so he could come to live within us by a spirit and do his new thing in our lives now and forever. And he's seeking us today. And so the question is, will I respond? That's all I have for you today. Will you respond? I don't have to find him. He's already found me. I don't have to go searching. He's already searched me out. And so today I ask this, will you just respond to the one who came for you? Would you allow him an interruption in your life? Would you allow him to move you from inside in a new way? Would you allow him to just pull you into a new level of intimacy with himself? And remember this, everybody. Revival starts with me (laughs) this Christmas, doesn't it? I wonder if Christmas could become a time of revival in our lives. Break out all out, hands up, surrendered, spirit turned loose, revival in our lives as we seek after Jesus. And so I do pray and and wish upon you and your family a blessed Christmas, students, in Jesus Christ. Amen.